going to talk about uh, Julia and D3 primarily. That's why they're in color and everything else is in white. Um, but uh, a little bit about what, uh, what I do and how I ended up doing this first. So, get this chair out of my way. so my name is Philip. I'm Blues Moon on Twitter. And uh, I mentioned at the start uh, before many people came in, these slides are online right now. So speakerdeck.com slash bluesmoon. Yeah, it'll be easier to click on the links rather than tag them off from uh, what's on screen. So if you do want to do that, uh, and feel free to look ahead as well. Um, so I'm, I work at a company called Sosta that's down here. It's pronounced uh, like you would pronounce Tosta in New England. <laughs> Tosta. Still getting used to the accent. I, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, my company is based in Mountain View. So I, uh, I started working on Julia in February of this year and D3 in January of this year. And uh, so this talk is really what I've learned in the last uh, four to five months um, and how I tie the two together uh, to create interesting and fun visualizations. Um, my primary job has uh, been collecting real user performance metrics. So we measure how long it takes web pages to load from the end user's perspective send that back to our servers and do some basic analysis. And now we're moving into more advanced analysis. So that's where I started uh, doing this kind of work. Um, yeah, I should mention uh, Ampulse is available here. You can get it for free up to a certain limit. Uh, Boomerang is the JavaScript library we use to collect data that's open source and a BSD license. So if you wanted to build your own web performance monitoring system, that, uh, that's a good place to start. All right, so I had this slide up earlier. If uh, there are going to be examples, I'm actually going to run through all of them. But if you did want to follow along, you wanted to try the things out, you can sign into Julia Box, which I will show you. Uh, well, I, I won't actually sign in right now because it tends to fail once or twice, and I don't want that to happen while I'm presenting. But if you sign in, uh, you will get something like you'll get something like this. So this is a Julia Box uh, instance. Uh, it's got the two directories that I have. So the tutorial is in there by default. If you sign in, you can actually just start learning Julia, and I can walk away from here. But it wouldn't tell you anything about D3, so I'm going to stick around. Um, there is this uh, sync tab, which is what I use to add my directory. So I added a, a Google Docs directory here, or you can add a Git clone directory. And uh, that's where the OS bridge folder comes from, all right? So let's go back to my presentation. Right. So who here is familiar with Julia? It's already welcome. One, two. All right, a few people. That's good, because you might actually know more than I do about Julia. <laughs> like I said, I've only been working with Julia for four months. Um, what I understand is it's a fairly high-level language. It's uh, highly performant, so it, uh, it does have strong types. Uh, it's strong types that are not necessarily strongly enforced. Um, but what happens is when it compiles, it uh, links everything, all variables, to a type, and that kind of makes the, it faster for the compiler to process things. It borrows uh, syntax heavily from R and Python and MATLAB. So if you're familiar with any of these languages, uh, you can get started with Julia pretty immediately. You don't, uh, you don't need to read too many docs to get started. It helps to read the docs because some things are different, but not uh, too far off. In terms of performance, uh, this is the, based on benchmarks run by the Julia team. Uh, it's comparable to C. The only thing faster is Fortran. I don't remember Fortran from when I studied it uh, yeah, 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's designed for parallelism and cloud computing. So it's, uh, it's got a lot of constructs built in that let you run a single function across multiple cores or multiple machines. And it ties in very well with, uh, with various cloud services. So you can load, uh, run things across different EC2 instances. They actually have libraries to spin up new EC2 instances if you need that and uh, communicate over SSH with, between them. Right? And it's MIT licensed. I should mention this uh, one caveat here. The, the Julia code itself is MIT licensed. Uh, a lot of the libraries that it's built on, uh, uh, GPL or uh, BSD or Apache license. So the overall license of the environment itself is GPL. 
some people don't like that. Some people like that a lot. Uh, I'll let you choose uh, how you feel about it. Uh, what is D3? So who's familiar with D3? Good, many more people. Than... You might actually also know more about D3 than I do. But uh, I will try and go into a, a very brief introduction and then talk about how we specifically talk between Julia and D3. Uh, what D3 is, is uh, uh, I, I like to start this by saying it's, it's not a visualization library. So many people look at D3 and say really good visualizations. That's true, but D3 on its own is not a visualization library. It's a Java library that maps data to DOM nodes. So it's, it's more like a data, app, uh, data mapping layer for your visualizations and your, uh, and your back end, kind of the, the model in your MVC uh, framework. It's extended by layouts and plugins, many of which are part of the core D3, uh, li D3 library itself. So if you're just using the minified combined D3.js that's on their website, you'll get a lot of these layouts and plugins uh, built in. So you can do things like histograms or uh, force directed layouts, uh, uh, Sankey charts, a whole bunch of things that uh, I don't understand all of them, but they look pretty, right? And um, if you just go to d3js.org, uh, there's a bunch of uh, examples there that you can click on to see what it looks like and see how simple the code looks. You do need to write code to draw things, but again, like I said, there are plugins that do some of that for you. So if you wanted to do a, a histogram, there's a plugin to do that, a line chart, a bar chart. There's, there's plugins to do that. I won't actually use any plugins in this, uh, in this talk. I'll write all the code from scratch. So um, it might seem the wrong way to do this, but it's, it's the best way to learn how it works. D3 is fast on its own. So because all it's doing is mapping data to uh, DOM nodes, it's pretty fast at doing that. The problem is uh, as the data size grows, your number of DOM nodes could grow. And that is a bottleneck. So the browser can't really handle too many DOM nodes. Like uh, I tried doing uh, some clustering visualizations. I ended up with the 250,000 uh, circles. And the browser did not like animating them. <laughs> uh, be not because there, was, uh, there were too many circles, but because there were too many DOM nodes representing those circles. Yeah. So it had a problem just having that many DOM nodes. So I changed it to use Canvas instead of using SVG. And it, it became like 100 times faster. Uh, simply because there was now nothing in memory. It was just pixels I was drawing. So a good rule of thumb is uh, the performance of Canvas is based on the height and width of your drawing surface. The performance of SVG is based on the number of nodes. So if you have too many nodes, go with Canvas. If you have few nodes that you want interactivity with, use SVG. Now you can't click on a, something in Canvas and have it react to that. But you can do that with SVG. Again, I'm not going to go into that because uh, that'll, we'll be talking until tomorrow. I did. Um, now, iJulia. Who here is familiar with the iJulia interface? All right. Who's familiar with the iPython interface? All right. iJulia is iPython with additional JavaScript and CSS, right. more or less. There's, it also tells uh, the back end to use the Julia kernel rather than the Python kernel. And you don't have R magic by default. Those are the main differences, I would say, between iPython and iJulia. Uh, so really what we're looking at when we say iJulia, we're looking at IPython, which has a Julia kernel on the back end. Uh, it talks to the Julia kernel. And you have a browser that's communicating over HTTP with the IPython server. And once a notebook opens up, it, it creates a WebSocket connection between the two. Uh, is everyone familiar with uh, how HTTP and WebSockets work? All right. You don't need to know the details, like what's the protocol and stuff, but is that this is a request response method, whereas this is an, sort of like an open TCP connection. You can keep sending commands, uh, getting responses back. The server can send a response without waiting for a request. So that's a cool thing, because then this code running in the browser can talk directly to the Julia kernel. And uh, then we have JavaScript running within the browser, within that IPython notebook. Also, JavaScript that you might write as part of your, your, the output of your cells. And finally, we have our D3. That's the thing that we add. Uh, so an iframe that contains D3. And I'll explain later why we use an iframe. And we can use JavaScript function calls or many other methods to communicate between the IPython JavaScript and that D3 JavaScript. So this is a kind of block diagram. And 
we're going to concentrate on how we get data from here to here. Right? So you either go this way or you go this way. And uh, we'll figure out the best way to do that. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, you can get started. Uh, go to juliabox.org. And uh, that's what I'm actually going to do now. So if anybody wants to do that, now's a good time. So I'm going to start off with a basic Julia tutorial, just uh, these four uh, steps in, in that particular, uh, so the, in this, at this URL, it's these notebooks, one to four. Right? So if you go to this URL, it's a, it's a Google Doc. There, are, uh, there should be six or seven notebooks in there. This, these are notebooks one to four that we're going to look at. Does anybody need me to wait? to get that, or should I switch over? Uh, you don't have to clone, so if you want to make changes and save your changes, then you do need the clone. Otherwise, you can just copy this URL and paste it into, when you look at the, the sync section, paste this URL in there, and it should find the Google Doc and uh, make, get your read-only copy. So you can still make changes locally, but when you clone, when you're Julia Box instance dies, all those changes will go away. Can you go to the sync tab real quick? Yep. Where in there do you think the sync? There were several boxes right Yeah. So we get here, we get the sync, and right here there's the Google Drive folder, so you okay. paste it in here. All right. And uh, it should resolve that pretty quickly, and then you type in a name there. It should pre-populate it with that folder name, which is OS Bridge. And then you have to click on the plus sign. Right? So I missed that the first time I did it, and uh, nothing was happening. So you click on that, and uh, then when you go back to the iJulia tab, it should show you that folder showing up. So I'd already changed into the OS Bridge folder. You can change into that now. And we'll open the first notebook. That's this one. So. Now, this is typically not the way you teach Julia. You wouldn't start with how do you print out JSON. But uh, the purpose of this talk is to figure out how do we get data from Julia to uh, JavaScript. So JSON's a big part of that, because uh, JSON stands for the JavaScript Object Notation. Um, Douglas Crockford claimed he discovered it. He doesn't know who invented it. But um, it's now become a, a de facto standard of, commu of communicating between two languages. Because uh, there are so many languages that have JSON parsers and, uh, and uh, serializers that you can actually use JSON to communicate between any two languages. Um, if you're using JavaScript, it's actually your, probably your only choice. Uh, you can probably do CSV or XML, but JSON is probably the, the fastest choice for communicating with JavaScript. Uh, there are probably way better things, uh, methods to communicate between other languages. But we need to use JSON because we have JavaScript on one end. So um, very quickly, well, what I'm doing here is I, I create an, a matrix, so a, a three by three matrix. Uh, the notation for creating a matrix, uh, square brackets, uh, spaces between elements that are on the same row, semicolons that uh, separate rows. Right? Uh, not too complicated. Uh, if you want to you make more dimensions than that, it does get a little complicated. I'm not going to go into that. Right, but uh, you, you do have to define an array with its dimensions. Now in this case, I haven't specified any type for the, for the array, but Julia has detected that everything in there is an int 64. So it says, okay, I've created a three by three array uh, in 64 of two dimensions. Right? And this is what my array looks like. And now I can call the JSON, so because I imported the JSON library, I can say JSON.JSON, which is uh, the function you use to serialize an object into JSON, pass it that uh, that array, and then it shows me what it would look like in JavaScript. And notice it's also enclosed in double quotes, that's because the, the output of this is a string. So it's showing me that this is a string that looks like this, and I could just print that onto my page or into my notebook uh, as a JavaScript variable, or the value of a JavaScript variable, and it would work. Right? And we'll see how we get to that uh, later on. Now this particular JSON is fairly simple, which is why I can I can just do json.json a. Uh, it's a two-dimensional array. But what if I had an object or a data frame that had multiple columns, multiple rows, and if I just did something like this, it would look horrendous. 
because uh, Julia is, uh, stores data in a column major format. So when you have a data frame, it's every column is stored separately. So when you serialize it, it serializes every column first and not row first, whereas your JavaScript is going to expect row first and not column first. So this is going to, it's just going to look terrible. That's a very good, very efficient data store for something in memory. It's terrible for converting to text. Right? And that's what we actually end up doing when we're serializing. So if you had your own uh, data structure, you might have to write your own serializer. And it's not too hard. Uh, you basically iterate in column major order and uh, construct uh, maybe an array of JSON strings. Or uh, I actually like to do it that way. So I, rather than create the whole thing as a single JSON object, uh, which tends to take a lot of memory because it's a large string, what I'll do is I'll create an array of strings, each of which uh, represents one row of my data frame. And that tends to be more efficient because it's easier to store smaller strings uh, they can go into different parts of memory rather than having a contiguous uh, place in memory. You can also stream that to the client rather than having to send the whole data structure and then deserializing it when you get that. So sending individual elements, uh, individual rows as single JSON strings just tends to be faster. Overall, uses less memory. Right. So, so how do we send this to the, the client? We can use Julia's display uh, method. So Julia has a display method that takes in a MIME type, and it can support several different MIME types. In this case, I'm using text HTML. Um, typically, you could write your own MIME type and implement a display method for that, and then Julia would just do the right thing when it sees that MIME type. Um, text HTML tends to be the only one I use. You could also use SVG. If you were just printing out SVG, it would actually go ahead and render that SVG. You can also do LaTeX. So it'll go ahead and render the LaTeX. Um, but HTML is, and JavaScript is the best way to communicate with D3. So what I'm doing is I say I'm adding script tag here, and then I add a script. So a script node. Can everyone see that? All right. Move it up. So I add the script node. All it's doing is saying var a. So that's actual JavaScript. So var a is equal to json.json a. And now I've enclosed this whole thing in a dollar uh, with parentheses. And that basically tells Julia that uh, everything inside there is Julia code, even though it's embedded in a string. So go ahead and execute that first and replace uh, that template. position. Yeah, it's, it's almost like templating. It's kind of uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword because you can do crazy things in here and kill yourself. But because you can write any Julia code, and it kind of confuses the parser if you have Julia code that also contains dollars and double quotes in there, because then it doesn't know if that double quote is from outside or inside and stuff. There have been uh, this has been the cause of several bugs in Julia, uh, like, so it's uh, it's been an evolving standard. But if you're doing something simple like we know what it's going to output, then that's kind of safe. So here all I'm doing is a is equal to JSON to JSON, and uh, then I'm printing that to my web dev console. So let's uh, go ahead and run this. Um, just like in any IPython uh, notebook, you do uh, control enter or command enter to execute it. So, command. So now I've gone and executed this and uh, Obviously, you see nothing because the uh, web dev console is closed. So what I'm going to do is open up the web dev console, and uh, we see here an array of three, okay, which I can expand. And it's, this is basically a JavaScript array. So I've got the values that I put in there. So JavaScript doesn't have the concept of two-dimensional arrays. Instead, it's an array of arrays, each of which has three number elements. Right? And it's also interesting to have a look at the elements here. So, let's reduce this a bit. so I'll, I'll go ahead and inspect this node. Uh, right here. So this was my output area. And if I look at that, it's got my adding script tag here. Then it's got the script tag, which contains JavaScript. So you see in here, it's actually well-formed JavaScript. It executes as soon as it shows up there. 
and it does whatever it's supposed to do. So using this method, we can send anything. We can send commands or data from the Julia kernel running on the back end all the way through the IPython system to the browser and then execute within the browser. And this is a pretty powerful way to uh, do interesting things like, uh, which I'll show you in the next notebook. Um, are there any questions at this point? So uh, if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask, right? Uh, also, is there a way to bring down the shades on that? This thing is like reflecting straight in my face. No shade, no shade there? All right, no problem. I'll just, I'll just stand further back. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah. this is very useful for exploratory work. What about production? Does Julia support something? Yeah, I mean, we are using Julia in production right now. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd build things in notebooks like I'm doing, but what you'd eventually do is take all that code, put it into a Julia library, and then call that out from your notebook. So if you have a lot of your data, which again, I'll show you how to import data and uh, do analysis on that data, uh, you can just run that. Uh, we just make it available to our customers so we, we've collected all this data for several years uh, about their web performance. So now they can go ahead and do analysis using either the functions we built, or they can write their own functions in their notebooks. So we'll just give them uh, like a Docker container with a bunch of notebooks pre-built, and they can write their own if they want it. So uh, one thing to note that I didn't mention earlier, every time you open a notebook, it'll go into the running state. And we've seen this uh, at our company that people don't realize that uh, too many notebooks running are going to make the server sluggish. So we'll end up with like 3,000 running notebooks. And that doesn't really work. And at some point, your system stops responding. So uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and shut this down. Julia Box will actually terminate after six hours of use, so it's, it's fine here. But if you have a long-running production system, just keep that in mind. Um, there's, uh, there's probably something here that tells you oh, yeah, running uh, all the notebooks that are running. So if you just go to that, you can see all the running notebooks. And this is true for IPython as well. It's not specific to Julia. Um, matrix operations in, in Julia. And this is something we use a lot. Uh, not just simple matrices like this, but uh, also things like uh, with all of our uh, performance data, we'll sort of uh, create clusters um, based on the various dimensions that we have. So we'll have interesting um, matrices that are significantly more than three by three uh, in size. Um, but that won't fit on screen. Uh, I'll show you some of them later on, but uh, this is a good way to start off. Uh, now, Julia supports uh, full Unicode operators as well as uh, variable names. So you can do interesting things. Like in this case, the, the single quote character is also the transpose operator. So you can just uh, define a, an array, uh, a matrix like this, and call A prime, and it transposes it like that. Um, just uh, note that uh, raised to minus one is not actually the inverse operator. Uh, so if you, if you do A raised to minus one, that's uh, that's just a variable called a raised to minus one, right? And you actually have to define that variable. So the, the actual uh, inverse operator you can do, well, you can, you, there's also functions you can call. So I mentioned uh, with pipe, you can also just call transpose on it if uh, you want to be verbose and have your code more readable. So it depends on whether you're, you, the other people on your team, are they mathematicians or are they programmers, right? <laughs> it's going to be one or the other. And uh, I tend to like uh, to write um, more in math notation than programmer notation, but the rest of my team doesn't like that. So you actually do a raised to minus one, or you can do, uh, uh, what's the other one? Inverse, i and v. Right? So you can call either of those functions to invert it. Um, now, you can do a dot product or a cross product. So the dot product, you actually use the dot operator which is not the same as a, a period operator. You know, in LaTeX, you'd use a backslash C dot tab, and it'll create that operator. So two matrices with a dot between them would create, give you a dot product. Similarly, the times operator will give you the cross product. So here we've got uh, 
The transpose into the inverse is uh, three because it's one, one, one diagonal and it's summed up to three as a dot product. Uh, vectors, as usual, are single dimension matrices, but we can do interesting things because vectors turn out to also be sets. So you can do set operators like the intersection operator or the, the union operator. Um, you can do the in operator, so it's in or not in or subset. Um, I tend to never remember these, well, subset, I never remember which one because there's three latex symbols that, uh, that look similar to it. So I just do backslash sub set tab and I'll try all of them until one works. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's this one with the single EQ. <laughs> so you know that this is really just using, it's set operations over array. There's no, they're multi-sets because there's no uniqueing. And it's presumably uh, exactly. doing like yeah. linear search. It's not yeah. hashing or, or any other Th stuff. That's right. So you can actually, there is a set data type which you can define an array as a set and then it'll do things like uniquing and stuff. Uh, but it, in my usage, it's never actually been necessary. Like you'd need that when you're doing uh, things with strings and stuff where uh, if you're just doing numbers, uh, it's probably more likely you, you just uh, have a list of numbers where the sequence matters and uh, you're doing some operations on them. Uh, there could be IDs and stuff, yeah, you can run unique on it. Uh, but I don't know if it's a linear search or not. It might be a linear search. Of, but, um. Sorry, are these operators, are they part of the language? Yeah, so, so this is all built into the language. Uh, and now when I say built into the language, I'll say it's part of the core libraries. So there's a base library, which you don't have to do using base because it's always included by default. And that's what actually exports all of these operators. And uh, all of these, are, they're actually functions. So they're, they're functions that take in two parameters. And uh, it just so happens because uh, uh, semantically Julia recognizes them as uh, operators, you can have it as an infix notation rather than having a prefix notation. Um, this is more likely what you'd do if you were writing code that uh, had uh, arrays that need to be concatenated. So hcat is a horizontal concatenation. So if you take these two arrays, you get that. And vcat does it vertically. So you end up with this. And uh, this is more likely to be how you'd construct your matrix when you're getting data out of your database or from your, uh, your data store where all your performance data was. And it's, it's what we use. So rather than actually generate a horizontal array, we have multiple vertical arrays that we concatenate. And, uh, create a huge matrix out of that that we can then uh, do analysis on. Uh, there's also libraries that uh, will let you do, um, uh, why am I forgetting this? Uh, clustering on the data. So you basically just give it uh, this whole matrix of data and uh, your distance function and it'll figure out uh, the best way to cluster it. Uh, it supports uh, four standard algorithms, k-means, k, -means, k -mean, it's, uh I don't even remember all my clustering algorithms. Never mind. Uh, so whenever you're doing, uh, oh, you can do uh, addition, subtraction, obviously. So you can, if you add two vectors like this, it uh, just adds them up. Um, wait, did that happen correctly? What were, what were my two arrays before? One, two, okay, yeah, so I just added them, so added it this way, so I get two. Oh. Yep, four, seven, 10, 13, 16 is the sum of these two arrays. Um, I cannot add uh, arrays or matrices that, are, that have different dimensions, so it'll give me an error. But, uh, I can do multiplication and division with scalars or with, uh, with other matrices. So A into two will actually multiply every element by two. A plus two will add two to every element and so on. So there's a small distinction between an array and a vector in Julia. An array by default is uh, a column. Uh, sorry, not a column. 
it's, it's basically a single row. Uh, you cannot run all operations on that, so you might need to explicitly convert it to a vector by using the vec function, which makes it a single column. And then you can compare things like run correlation on it, uh, which in this case, it's very highly correlated. So by default, the COR gives you uh, Pearson's correlation. There's also a spear, Spearman's correlation, or is it Spearman's no. <laughs> So again, you, there's tab completion, so if you don't remember a command, just uh, go in there and start hitting tab like crazy. No. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions so far? How am I doing on time? We have 15 minutes officially. 15 minutes officially? All right. We'll try and go faster. So uh, data frames, if you're familiar with uh, any of the other uh, data science languages, you're familiar with data frames. Um, in our case, we're using read table to read it out of a CSV because I don't want to connect to a DSN right now. But uh, Julia has very uh, good, um, its libraries allow it to connect to Redshift databases very easily. So you can just provide a Redshift DSN and it can pull data out of that, which is what we do uh, um, when we're working with the data. So rather than read out of CSVs, we're just reading it straight out of our Redshift database that, uh, that gets data streamed into it. Um, there's a bunch of functions you can run, size, names, et cetera, that uh, tell you information about the, the data frame. Uh, if you re reference a single column, it turns it, it's a data array. So a data frame is a collection of data arrays, each of which is a, a full column of the data. And this is a very efficient storage of uh, all that data. Uh, you can look at multiple rows or look at all rows. Um, you can look at multiple columns, in which case you get back a new data frame that has only those columns that you care about. Um, you can do but, some amount of... Yeah. That data copied or shared? Uh, that's all shared. So it, internally it uses something called uh, uh, optimized data array. Uh, so in, in this case, and even when you do a subset or a group by, it's all references back to the original rows. Um, but it also does something interesting where uh, things like strings and all, there's only one copy of it and everything else is a reference to that copy. And it does copy and write. So if you change a row, it'll only uh, it'll change the reference at that point. So you can have stats on, well, these are summary stats and all, they run on any array. So you can also pass it a data array. So in this case, all of my timers, the T done is the, the default load time timer that we have for for the performance measurement. So if I run summary stats on that, I get uh, a combination of things, uh, mean, median, uh, first and third quartiles, et cetera. Or I can do histograms, which is what we're gonna concentrate on for the rest of this. So if I just call the hist function, uh, it gives me a pretty uh, simple histogram by splitting the data into equal buckets. But that's not necessarily optimal. So I might actually wanna define my buckets based on uh, the data. So in this case, what I did is I, I wrote a function um, which looks at the, it does an IQR, uh, looks at the IQR range and then uh, creates buckets based on that range. So, I mean, the, the contents of the function are, are obviously do something, but I brought this up because I wanted to introduce functions. So the way you write a function is with the function keyword, uh, function name, and then uh, all your function parameters. Now, I've used data types for the function parameters. So I said results is a data frame and timer is a symbol, but those data types are optional. Julia will at compile time figure out what the data type should be based on how it's being called, and will at that time resolve data types. Now, it's, good, it's a good practice to specify data types because you might want to overload functions. So have the same function name that accepts different data types and does different things. There are also optional parameters, so anything separated, uh, anything after the semicolon is optional, and uh, you need to call that by name. So in this case, uh, we call the thresholds, uh, get symmetric thresholds method, and it returns a bunch of 27 uh, thre buckets, uh, 25, so it's equally divided into 25, and then two for the outliers, either on the low end or the high end. And uh, then I call the histogram function with these thresholds, and uh, I get 
a much better looking array than uh, the first one. So if you look at the first one up here, that had almost everything in that first bucket because of the, the large outliers on the end. But after doing the IQR filtering and uh, then getting a histogram, I've now got something much better. Uh, it's here. Where things are evenly spaced out across multiple buckets and uh, buckets are defined in thresholds. So, uh, lastly, I can also split uh, my a certain column. So, I can use the by function and specify one or more columns uh, saying group by this, and it gives me uh, a list of, so it aggregates all of these using, so in this case, the median function. And it gives me the median of everything that matches AOL or uh, Android browser and so on. Yeah, so th this, is, this is actually how you define a lambda in, uh, in Julia, so just using the, the arrow operator. Uh, this is the, the iterator, and this is the, uh, the actual function you call on that. Uh, I could have multiple parameters. Uh, it would be a tuple in that case rather than being a single variable. So there are problems if that aggregation function returns an array. It will have one row per, per array element. So in our case, to get a histogram for each of these, what we'll do is we'll JSON serialize it and store the string in the, in the data frame rather than storing the array. And then we deserialize it later if we need to. But if you're sending it to JavaScript, you don't actually need to because what you need is a JSON. So I have this JSON here because that's what we copy to our data frames. All right, so la this is the last one I'm going to show in, in terms of Julia. But again, it's a lot of JavaScript. Here what I'm doing is uh, I display a node with a particular ID. So that creates a, a, a node in HTML which has an ID. And it says nothing here because uh, that's the HTML I printed out there. Right, so execute that. And then what I can do is uh, I can go ahead and modify that by defining a function in JavaScript that takes in some text and modifies what's in that DOM node using get elements by ID to identify that DOM node in JavaScript. So then I could call something like uh, this function here, which I'm, I've defined here, so the window display ID. I'm calling that function with hello world. When I do that, it changes the text up there to hello world. Now this uh, simple construct is something that you will use a lot when you're communicating between Julia and D3 because that's how you keep sending data to the, the original iframe or D3 object that you created. Right. So. Um, looking at the D3 thing, I'm actually going to skip over a lot of the basic examples because a lot of you put your hands up. So right. so I've got a bunch of uh, examples up here that are not very interesting. All it does is include the uh, D3 library. There's uh, one here called data mapped. So for this. So what I'm doing is I, I create the, uh, the initial D3 uh, object, and then I have this data here that I add to my DOM. So there's this thing called funky.entro. Can everyone see this? Make it a little bigger. Too big. All right. So the enter selection is every time new data comes in, if it's not already mapped to a DOM node, this is what we do to map it. So I append a line node in this case. I give it a class and uh, x and y parameters. And then for things that already exist, all right, I'm, so this is only the enter. And if you notice it doesn't do anything interesting. Right? It looks like one line. I've actually got uh, several lines here. 
one for each data element in my array. Right? So I had my array here which had several data elements and each of them resulted in one line. So this is not very interesting because right, it maps the number of nodes to the number of elements, but it's not doing anything with that. Oh. Let's go to data-driven documents, which is what D3 stands for. So in this case, what I've done is I have the data, but now my data nodes are based on uh, the value of that particular element. So here my x1 is based on the value of i, which is my iterator telling me which data point it is. My x2 is also based on that, and my y1 and y2 are based on the, the value of that data point. So in this case, I can get a line that grows or shrinks. So let's actually look at the DOM nodes for this. So notice how many DOM nodes there are here. Right? There's one for every element. And now if I change the, the elements that are in there, so let's just take out most of them. Notice how the DOM changed? All of those nodes disappeared. Because D3 realized that those ele data elements are no longer there, so those DOM nodes are not required. And if I add, or let's say I change something and add something else, it's going to add new nodes for those. It's going to replace. So the, the first node which I modified is just going to change its value. And the other nodes, it's going to add new nodes for them and give them the values that I did. Right? And that's all based on this, this code that I've added here. So uh, this is the one to add it. So remember, I just added the line and its class. Then I keep changing things based on the, ex, uh, based on the actual value of the data. And then anything that's been removed, I just call dot remove. And this is uh, something that we'll use, again, a lot with D3, which brings me to this, which is the histogram that we had mapped onto, instead of lines, mapped onto rectangles, which also happens to be my t-shirt. Um, because that's how <laughs> I printed out this t-shirt with, uh, instead of 10,000 data points, with. Uh, about a quarter of a million data points and much smaller bars. <laughs> so, um, but that's what we get, again, just using D3 and using that data from the histogram. Right? So, and if I look at the script here, it's, I've actually hard-coded this, so I cheated. But that's going to change. So, what I really want to do is have this histogram. You notice the histogram here? driven from Julia. And since I have no Julia here, there's nothing to drive it. So let's go back to my notebook. And uh, I'll go straight to this one. So passing data to an iframe. So first thing we need to know is how do we create an iframe? Remember how we created the paragraph node the first time? We create an iframe exactly the same way. Instead of saying P, we say iframe. And instead of changing inner text, we change SRC. So we have, it's a little more HTML and JavaScript, but it's exactly the same as we did for adding that paragraph node and changing the text in it. And uh, we have this update function again that changes the SRC. And we also overload it. So in this case, we declared another update iframe. We declared two update iframes, one that takes uh, a URL and the other that does a post message. And I need to run all. So that's what we have now. This, uh, this data has been passed from Julia to the iframe. In this case, it's uh, passing it on the URL. So I see the, all the data passed on the query string here which my D3 uh, library, uh, D3 code has read and then passed on to the histogram code. But then I can also call update iframe with this, with uh, an integer array or actually any array. And uh, what will happen is, uh, it should have, there's no array in 64. I think I know why.
All right, I will skip over that and we'll go down to the next. So again, I've copied all the code from the initial uh, notebook that had the data frame stuff that generated this particular table. You remember that? And what I'm now going to do is iterate through all of those. So for i in one to size group, create an iframe for each of them with the URL and print out the, the data below it. So this is what the AOL histogram looks like. This is what the Android browser histogram looks like. So the BlackBerry histogram looks like. So the Chrome histogram looks like. So obviously a lot more people use Chrome than Blackberries. Uh, Chrome Mobile, fewer than Chrome, but more than the others. Uh, Chrome Mobile iOS, almost nobody uses it. Like three records. Uh, Firefox has a lot. Internet Explorer has a lot, and and so on. So you see, we when now. We've got these multiple rows that previously were just shown as a data frame here, which you can't really visualize how they compare to each other. But now using all these constructs that we built up over time, and it hasn't taken a long time to build this up, we end up with a, a good visualization of what our data actually looks like, how these distributions compare to each other. Now you could do the same, just changing your D3 code. You could generate a CDF or do uh, KS, uh, analysis on it, uh, do Holt Winters analysis on AI. So rather, you do all of that in Julia, and then just pass your results to D3 to do visualizations. Right. So I think I just have like one or two slides left uh, with links. But, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll end this here, actually. Um, so ideally, it would be nice if we could also use this WebSocket, which uh, you can actually do. There's something called interact.jl, which uh, is a Julia library that hooks into that WebSocket that you can use to communicate with. Um, well, that's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you.